Um, but um, I want to talk a bit about unity, but let's just commit this time before the Lord. Father, thank you. Lord, we thank you that because of love that you did place yourself in harm's way. And you set such a magnificent precedent for us because you showed that there is greater love that no man has ever, ever had than for him to lay down his life for his friends. Um, and that sacrifice um, is such a key, key learning for all of us to make sure that we implement in any relationship that we have. And so, Lord, for that, we just thank you. And Lord, I just pray that the listeners here, Lord, that, that they get something out of this that's portable enough that they incorporate in their lives. Lord, I pray that it travels with them and it doesn't just sound good or act as a momentary encouragement, but we would see application um, and that it would stay and that it would change lives so that we could be better servants, uh, better advocates for the kingdom, and most importantly, better living epistles that men and women might come to Jesus as their savior because of something that they incorporate from these words, which is the biggest idea all, of all. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so this uh, slide says unity. It's not a novel title of the message, just unity. Um, but I, but I rest, I've been wrestling with this for a really, really long time. And, um, you know, this picture is that of a, a, a rope that's a threefold cord. And, you know, when you think about a threefold cord not being easily broken, um, where the Lord is there and, and other people are there and you kind of are connected and there's strength in that. If you ever tried to tie something down with a one cord rope, you, you hope and pray it doesn't break. But um, I guess we live in a time where we're seeing an increasing heightened amount of separation and polarization in our society. I mean, that's not even, that's a big understatement, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, unless you've been living in a cave covered by a rock, buried in dirt, deep, like deep dirt, Pastor Sam. You, a lack of unity has, now make no mistake, a lack of unity has always been present going all the way back to the fall in the garden. Um, but, but there seems to be, despite a record high number of ways to interact and socialize, right, with Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and blogs and text messages, You'd, you'd think that in that environment, we would be more connected. But it, the irony is, is that social media hasn't made us at all more social, which is sort of the, the, the irony in that. Um, there's a call for unity, and many waited with bated breath and hearty anticipation when President Barack Obama was elected president in 2008, he brought a freshness and a vibrant call for hope and change that fueled the best optimism in many people, regardless of your partisanism or your, your bend, that yes, we could, and we could be a more perfect union, and that um, we would be a more unified society. Yet eight years later, I would dare say we see a less unified society Scorched earth policies, us versus them-ism, a spiral downward and race, what I told Pastor Sam the other day, a race to the bottom, with unity seeming more and more like a dream deferred than one realized. And I think because of that, people are at an all-time low level of, of hopelessness. Because they think, man, we, we, we thought we might be moving in a better place. But I would say that what it has done is the right thing is because I think it's drawn attention to the fact that true unity will never be elected. True unity will come from the Spirit of God. And maybe it's been a demonstration project to prove those that may not accept or believe that, that it is just that. 
I'm here to tell you like that song, looking for love in all the wrong places. We might have been looking for unity in all the wrong places. Amen. We may have been looking for hope in all the wrong places. Unless the Lord build the house, as I said earlier, they that labor do labor in vain that build it. Jesus Christ, make no mistake and don't get it twisted, is the only path to unity. And I'm here to talk for just a few moments just about that. I'm going to share some slides. But there's a story I want to share with you. There was a horse pulling contest in Canada. They do that a lot up there, Pat Sam. And ever since Justin Bieber left, they don't know what to do. Let's pull horses. But um, so this, is, this is, was the horse pulling experiment. They put weights on a flatbed wagon, and a single horse pulled it a measured distance. They added 1,000 pounds at a time until the horse could no longer pull it, and the winner pulled 9,000 pounds total. The winner of the horse pulling contest pulled 9,000 pounds of weight. The runner-up pulled 8,000 pounds. Now, out of curiosity, someone suggested putting both horses together. And while they hitched both horses to the wagon, they pulled 31,000 pounds. Working together, the horses pulled more than three times the weight that the best of them could have pulled individually. And so it is with humans that when we work together, we can certainly accomplish more than we can separately. Amen. Um, so let me see if this will work for me here. Hey, OK, I want to share a few things with you, and I'm just going to kind of share some thoughts. The reason why unity is important is not just because we can accomplish more. The most important reason that unity is important is because God desires unity. So even if we didn't see the practical benefit of it, at least not from the discernible eye, in the book of Psalms it says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God says it's good and it's pleasant for, for people to dwell together in unity. And sometimes in our society, a premium is put on being smart and right and accomplishing more than if, in fact, you were unified. I said a whole lot there, and you'll probably unpack that. Smart and right and accomplishing a lot, and I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. The, the scripture that Brother Tarek read, Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. God calls us to a unity that is good. And again, here's what I love about that scripture. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It implies that the lack of unity is bad. It's good and pleasant, right? For brethren to dwell together in uni unity. Uh, Psalm 133. So that means that if you don't dwell together in unity, God is saying that's bad. And so let me, let me come more closer to your house. If you're operating in an environment where you're not unified, God says, that's bad. You're participating in something that's bad. God calls unity good. Paul in Ephesians speaks of endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. Listen to this, in the bond of peace as a part of that narrative in the chapter, he's talking about walking worthy of the calling in that whole book, walk worthy of the calling, the vocation we're called to. Our vocation, as Paul says, is, or our craft, if you will, is to walk worthy of our calling. And by doing that, a part of that or component of that is being unified. And so he goes on to say, um, Walk, establish that unity in the bond of peace, meaning it's not unity at all costs. There are some people that would suggest that, well, the end justifies the mean or by any means necessary. It says establishing and keeping unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So again, if, 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 if you're trying to accomplish that, and peace isn't a part of it, then you're operating to get to a goal that's outside of the recipe book that God is suggesting. You can't lose peace in the name of trying to establish unity. And there are some groups, there are some organizations, there are some factions, there are some people, errant groups throughout the world that have uh, a motive to establish unity. Gosh, Adolf Hitler wanted unity. 
he certainly wasn't trying to vast advance it in the bond of peace. So the qualifier in establishing this unity is first and foremost, God desires it. He calls it good. And to establish it in the way that's the godly way or road to doing that is doing so in the bond of peace. And so when we are in relationships or whether it be home or work or at church or in the community or in schools or volunteerism, whatever the interactions are, are we endeavoring to establish unity and are we doing so in the bond of peace? So we know that God desires unity, and not only that, Jesus prayed for unity. Jesus prayed for unity. So these are two really good reasons why we should try to advance unity. Jesus prayed for unity. John 17, uh, cha uh, chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. This is what Jesus prayed. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you and they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me that was the prayer of Jesus that's a whopper of a prayer he says that that they may be one as you father are in me and I in you see again Jesus is praying that I want them to mimic this dynamic there's this kind of the symbiotic relationship between the father and son. And I might add, just as a bit of a bonus track for married couples, oneness and roles did not compromise oneness, right? So the Bible says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. The father directs. The Bible says that that, that, G, but that all things were created through the spoken word of the Son. The Holy Spirit convicts and guides and brings us into acknowledgement. There's no struggle for who is in charge in the Godhead, but don't they have distinct and different roles? And so Jesus is saying, I'm showing you a mystery that I'm praying for them to be one, not just one, but, but example, like, like us. Do it like us. Do oneness like us. Because if they do oneness, because you can do oneness, there's a conformity. Uh, you can conform. You can do oneness like Adolf Hitler did oneness. But he says, no, no, do oneness like this. So that what's the big idea? That the world may believe that you sent me. Because ultimately, I want the world, we want the world to know that Jesus was sent into the world to save the world. That's the reason why, and guess what? No difference. Your unity is a direct relationship to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We are living epistles, read of all men, not in the tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. How do we lift him up? By being one this is why Jesus is saying, you father in me, I in you, and they also may be one in us. So if that's happening, they'll believe that you sent the son. Our motivation for unity is greater than our contentment. It's greater than our personal happiness, but it's a catalyst for the world to see the authenticity of what we offer in Christ as a savior. That they may believe in Jesus and the father that sent him. That's the big idea of unity. That's the big idea. It's more than just what I get out of it. And then that how we go. We go to these places of what I get out of it. It is, I would dare say, and, and I'm not going to, again, here, when I talk about politics, I talk around it and not through it. And here's how I'm going to talk around it. We are so, God calls us that. We're selfish. And by selfish, meaning self-oriented. When people make choices around certain things, one of the first things they say is, how does this person align to what is good for? It's millions of people in this country. How cavalier to vote based on... And I used to hear my mother say statements like, well, Lord, I'm not going to say it. She might listen to the tape. I love her. She gave me great advice this week. She said, 
pray for your little brother and help him. And I did. Um, so Jesus is praying for unity. So another reason around unity, just a topic I want to talk about. Jesus died for unity. Ephesians 2.16 says, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. Somebody say one body. Through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And when we think about the word enmity, because it, it talks about that we're putting to death. Jesus' cross, reconcile and put to death enmity. Well, it would beg the question, well, what is enmity? What, what is the definition of that word? Well, well the word uh, enmity is rooted in the, a deep-rooted hatred. Now, that's a tough thing for us to hear because what you then have to recognize, you're saying, so wait a minute. Before the reconciliation with the cross, there was deep-rooted hatred between me and Jesus Christ? That, that's hard to wrap our heads around because Jesus is love and God is love. And, and that's the reason why our, our message to share the gospel so that people might come. Yes, there was the reconciliation means bringing together that which was scattered. Enmity is a deep-rooted hatred. Isn't that what we are seeing in this election cycle? Deep-rooted hatred visceral vitriol the, the cross of jesus put to death hatred this is the response of the believer we have the ability to model but not join that conversation recognizing that the cross of jesus christ through ephesians 2 16 he reconciled in one body to god and put to death enmity so if you're walking in hatred and again, if it quacks like a duck and his whiteness got orange feet, it's a duck. You don't, you may not say I'm walking in hatred, but if behaviorally your behavior is symbolic of hatred, then you're walking in hatred, whether you say the word hate or not. If you're, we are not called as we walk in a reconciled life. God has put to death deep rooted hatred and the scattering to bring together through his death, burial, and resurrection, he put to death that we might be children of light walking in that light. And I, I, I think about um, how important that is. Um, you know, you move through life, and when you take a stand for Jesus Christ, sometimes it will cost you something. It'll cost you, you know, Friends, I, I grew up in a neighborhood in the uh, city of Detroit. It's so funny when uh, Pastor Sam was asking me about, um, he was like, that song that Brother Paul sang, who's that? I said, well, that's B.B. Winans. It's interesting. He's two years older than me, but B.B. Winans and I and C.C., we went to the same high school. Their, their dad, Pop Winans, used to, to cut, um, cut my hair, my brother's hair, uh, before they became famous. Then he wasn't cutting hair no more. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't cut no hair. Uh, um, but... Um, you grow up in a neighborhood if you're like me and sometimes you have childhood friends and you guys are playing together, you know, kick the can or basketball, soccer, you know, basketball, like we, we'd play one block against the other. And my best friend, his name was Andre Hoskins and uh, we would all play together. And what would happen is that we were always in, he had a big porch in the backyard. We play superheroes, jumping off his porch, wrap towels around our necks like we were, you know, superheroes. And my mother observed something that started to happen. We hit the age of about 13. And what started to happen was, on the block of Stopel in Detroit, there was one group that were, we were sort of staying kind of positive. I wasn't born again yet. I was sort of, but a morally good family. But then there was this, fan, there was this, this group that started to drink and smoke. And actually down in the, the garage down the street, uh, we were all making mini bikes together, and the mini bike garage became the garage where the older brothers of some of the kids my age were giving kids um, beer and wine. And my mother was able to spot what was going on, and she said, um, y You all aren't playing when you go down to the 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 Hoskins garage because I don't see the ball out what do, what are you all doing down there and I wasn't in, involved in it but she saw that there was an opportunity 
for me to get joined with a different group. She said, you know what? I'm going to send you and your brother to, uh, I've been talking to a sister, a friend of mine, Camp Tall Turf. It's a Christian camp. I'm going to send you to this camp. And what started to happen was our, my friends changed. And, and the unity that I had with the people in the neighborhood, my friends, my buddies that we grew up together, I, I knew them, but I disconnected from them because they were going down a different path. And some of them went down a really, really bad path. And so I say that to say that, that when there is this, this opportunity for unity, it may cost you something. It may cost you some friendships. It may cost you some decisions because God is interested in your long-term view and not, not the short-term. So again, I just wanted to throw that story in there. I thought it was relevant. So the next thing is God's nature demands unity. God's nature, his very nature demands unity. Deuteronomy 6 and 5 says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So God's very nature demands that as a body of Christ, that we unite around one common notion, okay? So what unifies us is uniting around the common notion that we are to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. That rally cry of the Christian is what unites us. That's what unites us, is that, 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 that we are to love him with all heart. Because when you love him with your heart, your soul, and your strength, and someone else loves him with their heart, soul, and strength, there is common ground. Again, how can two walk together unless they first be what? Agreed. You can't walk together if you're not. And if I'm not in agreement with Brother Paul that I'm loving the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with, with all my strength, if I'm not in agreement and he's saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm loving him with this and I'm sort of giving him some strength, but, but I'm not feeling all of it all the time, then, then our unity is going to be challenged. Our unity is going to be challenged. And, and, and again, a lot of times we're trying to repair unity with duct tape and rubber bands, right? Not recognizing that, that, that if we trace it back, the source of the, 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 the dysfunction or the disconnection could very well be we're not aligned on who we are. Pastor Sam and I were having a good conversation the other day about first and foremost, before I'm anything, and I know he's preached it up here, I'm a child of God. I'm a blood-bought saint. That's, that's, that's who I am first and foremost. And there's certain things about me that I don't have to tell you that I am because you see it. Are you? Yeah, you are. <laughs> Let's check that one off. I can see. Uh, but, but, but again, we, God demands unity. First uh, John 4, 20 says, how can you love God whom you have not seen yet not love your brother who you see daily? God is saying, if you want to be in union with me, in this relationship, this salvation union relationship, one of the ways that I'm evaluating the authenticity of that is how you are in unity with your brother. How can you love me? You've never seen me other than in the scriptures. You see your brother every day. And is there a differential kind of love that you give to him that you, then you give me? He says, God forbid. And yet, one of the biggest uh, deterrents for many people coming to church is church folks. Some people are like, man, church would be okay if it wasn't for church folks. Because they're wanting to see us love. Gang members love the members in the gang. In the city of Chicago, they have people called L-Track drinkers. L-Track drinkers love it. L he'll, he'll give his buddy that last corner in the bottle of that, that wine bottle. Nobody from Chicago in here, but. So, <laughs> so it may not be the L-Track, but it was something. <laughs> so what is unity? We're talking a lot about unity. So what is unity? Um, I'm going to give a few examples or three or four definitional bullet points. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, so 
when I think about unity, one of the first components of unity is oneness, okay? Oneness. So when I think about oneness, you know, I'm, I'm married to a, a dancer, and so one of her favorite, you know, couples is Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. And I love the quote from Ginger Rogers who said, I did everything that Fred Astaire did, just backwards and in heels. It's like, man, that's tough. <laughs> It's like, try that. <laughs> try that, Fred. Um, and then that's Ozzie Davis and Ruby D. And, and, and they were married for over 50 years. And, and they were an, an um, activists and Hollywood uh, couple uh, pioneers. And, and they worked together as a couple, both in Hollywood as well as socially, as, as well as uh, at, they kind of mastered this kind of this family life as well as their, their, uh, their vocation. And so when you think about unity, it's oneness. And these are just some examples, object lessons. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13 says, I appeal, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought, and purpose for some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels my dear brothers and sisters and some of you I'm, I'm hearing you say I'm a follower of Paul I'm a follow Apollos I follow Peter I follow Christ has Christ been divided into factions was I Paul crucified for you were any of you baptized in the name of Paul of course not and and what he's talking about there and again it was just mentioned recently in a message here in the pulpit is that Oneness is, 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 is vital in defining unity because it is this idea. And oneness doesn't mean conform, conformity. It means oneness. And he, he defines it. Oneness united in one mind and in thought around the following of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that, you know, that's where we have harmony. That's where there should be no division is understanding who is Jesus Christ in our lives. And so you can't have unity without having oneness. Oneness is essential in that Jesus is Lord and we follow him. And again, you can do, you know, goose stepping and everybody's wearing the same things, but that's not oneness. The other thing uh, around uh, unity is having the same mind. So part of unity is having the same mind. Romans 12, 16 says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and do not think that you know it all. What is that mind? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. One mind. And that's the reason why people that get along really well in terms of, they say, man, I felt like you were reading my mind. Well, sometimes that can happen sort of, you know, just naturally and organically. But when, when you know, I've heard Pastor Tony say it, and I've heard a lot of other leaders say it, that when two people are on different ends of a spectrum and they can't seem to get together in unity, that if one person starts heading toward Jesus and the other person starts heading toward Jesus, you'll find that you end up in the exact same place. And so having the same mind, which is the mind of Christ, is essential for having unity. Because then it's not what I said, it's not what you said, but what does God say? What does God, that's the, God is the great arbitrator. You know, he's like in, in football when you have the, the, the review film. The mind of Christ is like the review film. It's like, okay, yeah, you say it's out of bounds, you say it's in. Okay, here's what I say. And then we accept that. And again, um, so again, a part of unity is not just having uh, oneness, but it's also having the same mind. And it's also having one heart. One heart. And what do we mean by that? Acts 4.32 says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say any of these things that he possessed were all their own. And this was just uh, talked about not too long ago here, but that they had all things common. But I love when the scripture here says they believed and they were of one heart and one soul. What is the heart? The heart is speaks of passion. It, it's like, what are your what, what are your desires? What are your passions? They have similar passions. OK, what you what you hunger for, what you have a 
thirst for, what you have a passion for. And so unity has everything to do with shared desires, shared passions. That's one of the reasons why when people are getting married and good marriage counselors start saying, you know, what's, what's your passion? You know, where do you see yourself retiring? What, you know, what is your, what, what's your personal passion in terms of a project or work? Is it children? Is it the homeless? Is it art? Because being of one heart, being of one passion will help unity advance itself very naturally, very naturally. And so again, the multitude of those who believed in the book of Acts were of one heart. And that's why that math of that number going from such a small number to over 30,000 was advanced because they were of one heart. And again, if we desire here at Monco and in your home, the same things, um, unity will be established. And not just that, but the same goal. Um, this is a, um, a cover of a book um, that came out several years ago. It's called Gung Ho. And it's a story written by a well-known business and leadership author. He's also a Christian, Ken, Ken Blanchard, who's written several books on leadership uh, and, and productivity. And this story is actually written uh, through the eyes of this indigenous American uh, in the uh, country here who is mentoring uh, a factory executive. If you've ever read the book, it's a really good read. And he uses three animals from nature to share strong leadership points and how to advance unity in the workplace and how to advance productivity. And he talks about the way of the beaver. He talks about uh, the gift of the goose. And he talks about the spirit of the squirrel. And one of the things he talks about with the squirrel, he says, one of the things that's interesting about the squirrel is that you don't have to call a huddle or WebEx to get all the squirrels to come together to say, all right, you know, it's time to all start gathering nuts. You ever notice they don't have those big like junkets or those meetings to talk about squirrel to nut gathering. And the reason is, is they have a shared goal. Their shared goal is, is that when winter comes, we need to eat. We need to have nuts. And so one of the, 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 the leadership principle in the book was make sure that you have shared goals, because if you have shared goals, then you don't have to tell people what to do. They do it. Good offensive line, a good uh, team, uh, you know, a good symphony orchestra at a certain point when your goal is to make melodic music, when your goal is to protect the quarterback, whatever your goal is, if you share it at a certain point, it runs on autopilot. It's plug and play. It's plug and play at a certain point. And so having, so how does that, that has everything to do with advancing unity. Because if you are both pursuing the same goals, if you are all pursuing the same goals, what, what, what's our mission here at Monco Bible Fellowship? Is to do what? All right. So, so Sister Carrie, you can tell Pastor Tony that mostly everybody got it. <laughs> but that's, is that, that's, our shared, that's a shared goal, right? That's one of our goals. And that is a, that, that's a driver, a lever of our unity. It's because we share that goal. That, and, and again, it, it helps keep things in scope and out of scope of what we do because it's a shared goal. Now I've got some questions for you. We're not going to pass the microphone around. This is when everybody always wakes up. It's like... <laughs> Does that come on film when I do that? Brother? That does. That was just illustrative. I didn't wipe anything from my mouth. That was all illustrative. Um, so when we think about, uh, I, here's a question I have for you. Is it possible to have union, union, without having unity? So you, you see here an example of what has been a cultural byproduct, an unintended consequence of our social. We, you see people together, they are, but, but I, I, I don't necessarily know that we have enough information to suggest that there is unity here. 
sometimes we see people together and they are in the same house and building and on the same date and in the same pew and say the right things. But like the Lord says, these people serve me with their lips, but their hearts are far, far from me. That's exactly what she's doing. Yeah, that's exactly what she's doing. Um, you can be connected to people, right? But it doesn't mean that you're unified, you know? And just ask people working together in a chain gang, right? They may, they may not be... This is just for kicks. I threw this in here. <laughs> now, on the surface, right... Togetherness and proximity does not mean unity. Goodness knows, that's right. Um, there, is, um, there are certain things that I would call unity busters, right? Um, there are certain things called unity uh, busters that I want to kind of share. These are things that can hurt your unity. There is a really good bit of work around unity and it's more specific to our married families but i would imagine there's some principles in here that everybody can draw from i'm going to ask brother irv to cue up this this clip and it's a book by a, a, a author a christian author by the name of dr willard f harley jr and it's sold more than a million copies it's now in its probably 16th, 17th edition, this is the 15th edition that we have. And Dr. Harley is uh, author of many books on marriage, including Love Busters, Five Steps to Romantic Love. He has a popular website, marriagebuilders.com. And Dr. Harley uh, lives with his wife, Joyce, of 38 years, praise God, in Minnesota. And one of the things that he did as a psychologist, psychiatrist, and engineer, as he talks about, it's a fascinating story, is he talks about this great research that he did about couples who remain together versus couples that get divorced. And I won't bore you with all of the details. I'll ask that you probably pick up the book. It's a good read. But he says that this is not a big notion, didn't take a psychology degree or a psychiatry uh, degree to come to this conclusion, that couples that were in romantic love actually never got divorced. He said, you know, as a believer, he said, actually, I factored in couples that prayed together, couples that went to church together, couples that, he said, even with all those factors, those were drivers, but the biggest driver of couples staying together were those that were in romantic love. And he says, those, those other things could hurt you. And so he said, so how is that defined? And so in his research, one of the things that he does is he talks about, it's, it's corollary to love languages. It's like what love languages, and so he lists out several ones. Affection, recreational companionship, admiration, domestic support, honesty and openness, family commitment, financial support. And so that was the currency that he used. And essentially throughout the book, they, they pretty much like with love languages say, how do you most feel loved? And to ask the spouse or companion spouse to, to say, all right, then make sure if that's how he feels loved, then ensure that you know, if it's honesty and openness, then fill his love bank with those love deposits, and that helped to recreate that romantic love. So when people say, well, I can't, you know, I'm not in love anymore, and he was saying that one of the catalysts to that is that, and so interestingly enough, he drew some differences between men and women, generally, and gets, if there's something not on the list, he and his wife say, put it on the list. So generally, he said that for, for men, that it was sexual fulfillment, uh, admiration, and uh, 
sexual fulfillment, ab admiration, and honesty and open, or, or a recreational companionship. So again, that kind of like, go to the football game with me, you know, be interested in me, and admire me, this whole idea of admire. For women, it was affection and conversation. They were tied. And so one of, th one of the things he talks about in this clip is really, really deep, and I think it applies to both men and women. I want to make, I'm still talking about unity, as the, patch, as the preacher would say, I'm still on my text. Play, hit the play, uh, please, brother. So he's talking about the, uh, the impact of affection and conversation and, and the guard here. And again, I'm, I'm going to use this to pivot into uh, Unity Busters. You can, you can play the promise of care is saying, I will be there for you when you need me. Now, there's an argument that could be made that if you are affectionate in your acts but not affectionate in your deeds, then the affection doesn't mean anything. Right. So if you mm -hmm. give your spouse a card saying how much I care about you, but then your actions are not caring, the card doesn't mean anything. So there's a sense in which affection has to be backed up by actual, actual care. Okay, the next is conversation. And like I say, the two go hand in hand. And, and I talk about intimate conversation as being important in marriage for women. And that is conversation about your personal feelings, about the problems you face, about your plans for the future, um, things that are personal that you talk to your spouse about deposit massive numbers of love units for a woman. Now, that's one of the reasons that a woman can have an affair with a man who simply talks to her. So somebody at work who is interested in the problems that she faces and simply talks to her about her personal problems, he can deposit so many love units that she ends up falling in love with him. So, you, so the, the thing that you have to understand about affection and conversation, is, and, and this is something I make a point of in, in his and her needs, is that they should be off limits to everyone except your spouse. So as a husband, you need to be a great conversationalist. You have to be very affectionate. And there isn't another man in her life that should be able to do either one of those things. I just want to add here. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's deep. Because when you think about love busters, understanding how we keep the unity in the bond of peace helps us understand how we can unravel the bond of unity in peace. And many of us can take a note to understand that there are certain ways that we can build unity in appropriate ways, and then there are unintentional consequences of building unity in inappropriate ways. Amen? Amen. So, <laughs> you, you do a, a test as a husband or a wife. If you were on trial for being married, and the prosecution wanted to find evidence to prove that you were married and not good roommates, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Share rent, budget, you manage the upkeep of your place, you coordinate schedules, you share chores, chores, you watch TV, you coordinate transportation, would there be enough evidence to prove that you are married and not just really good, socialized, very, very caring roommates? You don't have to answer that question. Unity busters. One of the ways you can bust unity is having a my way or the highway mentality. My way or the highway. Uh, if you think about, you know, this idea that love is and unity is give and take. Not just, this isn't just marriage. This is anywhere, right? This is work. You know, if, if, when you have a my way or the highway or that adage, are you listening or waiting to speak? You know there's a difference. 
between listening and waiting to speak. Are you listening? And sometimes if you're so rigid that it's only a good idea because it was your idea, you can certainly bust unity. Backbiting and gossiping. Romans 1.30 says, Oh, was that when, the, when, uh, it was that when they gave God up and would not even acknowledge him, God gave them up doing everything their minds would think of. Their lives became full of every wickedness and sin and greed and hatred, envy, murder, fighting, lying, bitterness and gossip. They were backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, braggarts, always thinking of new ways of sinning, continually being disobedient, trying to misunderstand, broken promises, without pity, uh, on and on and on and on. He was talking about, Paul was talking about this gossiping, backbiting, these people. He says, I gave them up unto these vile affections. When you think about unity, if you are a gossiper, again, if it quacks like a duck and it has orange feet, whether you use that phraseology, these things bust unity. Complaining and murmuring. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things what? Without murmurings and disputings. This disconnects you. Again, whether it be your parents, whether it be, and again, children. I don't know how many children are at this service. But, but again, these things, God says, are, are, are what usher in disunity. It starts to make it dysfunctional. Apathy. That's the, when, when did that I'm trying to do the whatever. I got this microphone. You know, you all know what this is. Jamie might know what this is from our young people. But yeah, this idea that you just don't care, um, just whatever. And, and again, you, you have to care. We saw examples of depositing into love banks. We saw examples of being regarded as being helpful and, and loving and caring. If you have a I don't care, that apathetic, that you're abdicating your responsibility to be a, 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 a unity contributor or a unity builder. Amen. You can't be apathetic. You have to have a position. Um, unfaithfulness. Um, Matthew 6.33 says, Fear none, none of the things which offer uh, shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou what? Faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Pastor Sam, I think, talked about it not long ago, about honoring your word even to your own personal hurt. Being unfaithful is a great way. If you want to undo unity, that's a great way. A leverage point to do that being but but being faithful as Matthew 6 33 says even unto death being faithful and then what I would call old drama new shade which is avoiding squabbles uh, in Philippians uh, Paul was writing uh, to your dais I beseech you your dais and beseech you uh, sent you that they may be of the same mind uh, the living Bible says that they should quarrel no more but be friends again it was like, listen, squash that. You know, there's stuff that goes on sometimes that life is too short. How many of you have loved ones that have gone on and they're no longer around and you wish you could have taken some moment in time to squash a silly little argument, a silly little disagreement, and you say that moment is gone. It doesn't have to be gone with the people that you can look around and see here today. You don't have to wait until they die to be remorseful about the fact that you didn't squash something silly. And as you look back on it, you even know it's even more silly than you thought it was then. So what do you need to do as I wrap up? Steps to achieving unity. You need to understand that forgiveness and restoration are important. And, I, and one thing I want to give you about forgiveness is three things are important with anything you do with forgiveness. Three elements that are important with forgiveness. This is really, really important. The first thing you, you, you should do is need to understand why what you're asking forgiving, forgiveness for was wrong. You need to understand why you did it, how it happened. It's sort of like a post-mortem. It's an anatomy. And, and I think to, the intention of wanting to give the other person the ability to move in reconciliation with you helps them to know that you understand why you're asking forgiveness. You ever had somebody say, I'm sorry, and they really weren't sure what they were saying they were sorry for? And, and again, because it, it's not really a good apology if they don't know why they're saying they're sorry. Apologize with a sincere heart. That's the second one. So understand why you did it. 
apologize with a sincere heart. And the third one is make a definitive plan of how you will ensure that the injury doesn't occur again. Because again, um, if you don't have a plan, it's just talk. Um, that's the difference between a good conversation and plan. And so again, um, I would say that um, you, you, you need to have the mind of Christ. You need to be other minded. See a little boy carrying his sister on his back. Go on, little guy. He's caring about somebody else, not just himself. And you have to purpose in your heart. Remember, Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. And he purposed in his heart. He wouldn't keep, eat the king's meat. You got a purpose in your heart that you're going to be a catalyst for unity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this. And we ask that you would continue to give us uh, words uh, to put in action, Lord, those things which uh, we have heard. And we thank you, Lord. Uh, there's a lot here, but Father, we know that you are the divine uh, spirit that, that, that can cause these things to come to our remembrance, and we hope that in some way that they can improve the way we are ministers for you and, and that we can catalyze unity, Lord, in this life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.